ビデオ If I had to choose a personal favorite of the old guard of American anime distribution companies, it would be AD Vision, aka ADV. Though they have long since morphed into Sentai Filmworks so they can follow their true destiny of selling $800 Legend of the Galactic Heroes box sets, the soul of ADV will always live on deep in my heart. I'll go into their detailed history in a later video, but you should really know that they were a scrappy little company that were inspired by the likes of Streamline and Animago, the ragtag bunch of otaku who pulled their resources together to create one of the biggest anime distributors of the 90s and 2000s. But the thing that will always stick with me was their localization. In a time where dubs range from uninspired at best and mind-blowingly amateur at worst, The Rising Sun of Japan! The sun is setting, dimwit. ADV's dubs were, by comparison, significantly better. They dedicated themselves in trying to raise the standard of localization in America, punching up scripts, utilizing detailed linear notes, even localizing the jokes to be more universal. Oh, this is Vegas, baby! I thought you said it was Denny's. You idiot. But that part looks like a Starbucks. Okay, they might have done the last thing a little too much, but also ADV was one of the first distribution companies to produce recognizable dub actors. It was ADV that was the proving ground for some of the most well-known dub actors of the anime fandom. Actors such as Spike Spencer, Lucy Christian, Amanda Wynn Lee, Brett Weaver, Jessica Calvello, and my personal favorite, Tiffany Grant. <laughs> Tiffany Grant, voice actress extraordinaire and number one Asuka Langley Soryu fangirl in the world. She ranks up there in the upper echelons of voice actors I am always happy to hear in things. Not only is her performance as Asuka one of the all-time classic English dub performances, My Unit 2 is the world's first real Evangelion! Created for actual combat conditions, it's the final production model! <gasps> but she also does a great job in voice acting in general. Her voice is instantly recognizable and yet has such amazing range. Take this, you! Die, damn it! Good morning, everyone. Have a nice day, buddy! Huh? But my favorite performances of hers are the ones that allow her to just go full-blown hot-headed. Grant is a master at roles that call for her to do high-quality histronics at even higher volumes. Which is why I want to talk about the anime that was Tiffany Grant's big break. An anime that not only helped her become known to the English-speaking otaku populace, but also help put ADV itself on the map. Suspect's vehicle is heading down Highway 9 into Tatsumi. They've got a hostage monkey, so don't go off half cocked. Yeah, yeah. Nineteen ninety one's burn up is a fifty minute OVA centered around three police officers, Maki, Yuka, and Raimi. The three of them are sick of being lowly SWAT officers on traffic patrol and would like to be more involved in exciting cases. Luckily for them, Maki ends up foiling a kidnapping in a very messy way, which gets them involved in a case involving human trafficking and big time entrepreneur Samuel McCoy. Even though they are told to hang back and follow the rules and regulations, Maki and the rest of them are loose cannons who want to get results, baby, and decide to take on the leads themselves. But during an undercover operation, Yuka winds up kidnapped by McCoy's goons, and it's up to Maki and Raimi to rescue her and the rest of the kidnapped young girls. If we want to talk about forgotten anime franchises, the Burn Up franchise is a great place to start. Animego did a subs only release in 1992, but it wouldn't be until three years later that the OVA really got attention when ADV released it with a dub. ADV had been distributing titles for a couple of years up to that point, but they were still relatively small time. It wouldn't be until Burn Up became a surprise hit that ADV would start taking the first steps to becoming the powerhouse of the late 90s, early 2000s scene that we all remember. For a short time, Burn Up was ADV's flagship title. The company would publish a comic based on the OVA. Only one issue was released, a second one was started but never finished. ADV would also help fund the creation of sequels to Burn Up, thus creating the franchise and... Boy, am I not looking forward to eventually having to talk about those stingers. Right, uh, so how can I help you, Rio? <laughs> Uh, if I give in, will you hold it against me? Uh, uh, regulation? Uh, 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 no! Then I'll be in the bathroom, okay? And basically, Burn Up became the anime people associated with ADV. That is, until next year when they acquired the rights to a little anime called Neon Genesis Evangelion, and the rest is history. But when you think about it, if it wasn't for Burn Up being the hit that it was, 
there would probably be no Evangelion in America for at least a couple of more years. Think about how much giant robot discourse that would have never come into being had it not been for this little lady action title. Burn Up is a lot more important than people give it credit for, in America anyway, so let's take a look and see if Burn Up is still hot after three decades. From an animation fan standpoint, Burn Up is a pleasant surprise. We're still deep in the golden age of the big budget OVA, so even relatively modest one-off affairs like this are still going to look nice. The animation might not be up to the standards of, say, riding Bean, but Burn Up has its own energy and is quite dedicated to it. The tone of Burn Up is a lot more comedic in nature, so there are a lot more cartoonish keyframes that help pace out the humor, jokes punctuated by quick glimpses of wacky faces and the like. But not so much that it moves focus away from the action, which is the rich cream feeling of this entire piece. Nearly every action sequence is this buttery smooth, richly choreographed scene designed to really ramp up the adrenaline. You really get the impression that the animators of Burn Up really want to show off their skills in imitating the best action films America has to offer, a theory supported by the entire end credits being a showcase of all their get in action. Like, look at this entire shot. It's just a police car going down a highway, and yet it's animated so smoothly. The level of detail to the vehicle itself, which if you look at it seems pretty complicated, stays consistent through this long sequence. I can't even begin to tell you how much work went into this single shot. Helping punctuate the animation is the soundtrack, which was done by Kenji Kawai. Kawhi was best known at the time for composing the soundtrack to the Pat Labor series, and you can totally see that influence here, especially in the opening chase sequence, which is set to this Judas Priest inspired heavy metal instrumental. Damn, we lost one. But I also got a hand it to how the staff built the world of Burn Up and how they show it to us primarily through visual means. There's things like how Japan has become a lot more multicultural in the past few decades, which is seen through one of the male characters being a black man. Hello. But then there's the technology. Usually in cyberpunk settings seen in anime, they really play up the futurism of the world to allow the rule of cool of technology to take over and make it seem all futury. Burn Up, on the other hand, explicitly takes place sometime in the near future, 30 years from now at the latest. And judging from the level of technology and how people interact with it, it almost seemed like not much has changed. Okay, you get things like laser rifles and cop cars shaped like Nolan's Batmobile, but a lot of the technology seen in Burn Up just seems to revel in the mundanity of such technology. Like the most advanced technological marvels we see in this world have all just gone into seedy nightclubs and billboard advertisements. Now you must rescue the princess from their infernal clutches. Play West Dragon, number 31. Pray for eternity, a new legend will be born! Plus, there's also a good joke about how technology can just make the simplest task all the more harder, with Maki trying to fill out her paperwork on an uncooperative touchscreen. I hate this machine! But since we spent a lot of time talking about the intro, I guess we'd better start talking about the dub. And it should come to no shock when I say that Tiffany Grant absolutely kills it as Maki. Maki, we could still change our minds right now. And leave Yuka to McCoy's mercy? No one here cares if she lives or dies! This is the role that establishes Grant's ability to play hot-headed women with temper issues. Maki is a very aggressive, hot-blooded protagonist, and Grant sells that character trait with gusto. Looking for the right, uh, guy? What?! <laughs> <laughs> Though in the interest of fairness, if there is one actress who does outdo Grant in this dub, it's Amanda Wynn Lee, best known for playing the little blue-haired girl opposite of Tiffany's favorite little red-haired girl. Can't help it. I love you. <laughs> That's enough to cause diabetes! Ow! We can easily chalk this up to experience, as Wynn Lee had been doing voiceover work since ADV's inception, starting with Devil Hunter Yoko. As a result, she sounds a lot more relaxed than in her element as Raimi which results in a far more natural performance. Okay, but at least try not to cause any trouble, all right? Also, gotta give it up for Aaron Crone with his performance as Samuel McCoy. It almost makes you wish he had more scenes as he really knows how to pour on the slime befitting that of a billionaire sex trafficker. Such determined young police officers. Goodness, did I forget a parking ticket? But does all this mean the dub is good overall? Not really? No matter how good some of the performances may be, the dub is still a product of its time. Voice acting direction for dubs was still a wild west of quality. 
This was the time where the focus of dubs were not performances, but trying to get the localized script to match up with the lip flaps. So it results in scenes like this. Here we come, Yuka. There's also the fact that the overall voice direction is all over the place. There are some scenes where the actors sound comfortable in their roles, and some scenes where they sound completely stilted. Even Tiffany Grant is not safe from the occasional weirdly inflicted line read. You've got two seconds to tell me where the girls are, or else I'll get aggressive. And for much as I praise the ADV dub actors, it should be noted that the best actors of this dub are the actors who would go on to do bigger and better things. There are a lot more bad actors than good in this dub, and their performances can range from boring and unremarkable, you know that gang of kidnappers we caught today? They work for Samuel McCoy. To Goofy and Lax. Boss! Big trouble! The police tank broke down the main gate! To whatever's in your mouth, spit it out now. Once you've been brought here, there are only two ways out. You can become what they want you to be. Or you can kill yourself. A few highlights are the communication operators all being voiced by the most jaded lady in existence, and it gets hilarious when they have to speak in unison. All SWAT teams, red alert! All SWAT teams, scramble! Or how about the voice actress from McCoy's Honey Trap? My boyfriend was supposed to meet me. <laughs> Her acting is so horrendous that I actually thought it was a joke about how only an idiot like Yuka would fall for such obvious bait. But then we meet her in the final confrontation, and it turns out that's actually how the actress chose to portray her. Don't move a muscle, bitch! Uh, uh, uh. Speaking of Yuka, let's talk Kimberly Yates. Don't be so smart! Where on earth have you been, young lady? Burn Up is also the big break for her, and she would star in a lot of other ADV dubs alongside Grant and Win Lee. But she's easily the weakest link of the trio. She's got a cute voice that fits a character like Yuka, but the way she says all her lines sound incredibly rough around the edges. All the lines sound very dragged out like she's looking at her script in the corner of her eye as she says her lines. Oh, I wish I had a date. Can I come along with you guys and watch? Huh? Huh? <laughs> I was just kidding. But to be fair, Yuka is implied to be a few fries short of a Happy Meal, so I guess this performance kind of works. New club for people with more money than common sense. I've been there before! Burn Up is, on the whole, a pretty serviceable lady action title. For one thing, it's structured in a way that can allow for extended action sequences to happen without bogging down the plots. Namely, having the two biggest action scenes be the bookends of the OVA, the first one to kick off the plot, and the last one, which runs about 15 minutes, to wrap up the plot. And in between it all is the story that connects the beginning action scene with the end action scene. A good plot sandwich nestled between two freshly baked slices of action bread. I also like how they handle the presence of the male characters in Burn Up, which is 9 out of 10 times my biggest pet peeve in other lady action titles. Instead of having some faceless cock trying to charm his way into the female lead spandex to force a will they or won't they romantic plotline, Burn Up establishes very early that Maki and the faceless cock of the series, Kenji, are already happily dating. And boy are they the most sickening sweethearts you ever did see. You hurt yourself again. Why must you risk that lovely face? Don't worry, it's nothing. Can't help it, I love you. The whole appeal of Burn Up is that it's a lighter, goofier, and way sexier take on the premier lady action title of the time, Bubblegum Crisis. AIC was making serious bank on Bubblegum Crisis, but the series had just gotten cut short that same year. Burn Up was one of the many productions looking to fill that empty space, and the production company to do that would be AIC, the creators of Bubblegum Crisis. Okay, the point is, is that comparisons are going to inevitably pop up when discussing these two anime. Maki is pretty much pressed down to the attitude and motorcycle, and Yuga, being that she's there to look cute and do little as possible, eases into her role as the Nene of the group. But Raimi seems to be both this weird amalgamation of both Lena and also Nene. Lena because she's a dark-haired plucky girl who's constantly complaining about her love life. I sure wish I had a boyfriend. Like that. Uh-huh. Finding the right guy is pretty hard. <laughs> you mean you're not getting laid either? Mm -hmm. It's temporary. But also Nene because she's the resident computer expert who also might be in love with her hacking tool to the point where she goes on a rampage when she sees it get damaged in a firefight. That's brand new! I'll pay for it! Do I do what my gross annual income is! 
Have another lead enema, you slime bag! And I think that's my problem with Maki and crew in that they never truly feel like their own characters, just more dumbed down versions of the Night Sabers. But my big problem with Burn Up is its overall tonal inconsistencies. For the most part, it wants to be a more lighthearted, sexier take on Bubblegum Crisis, and it wants to do that in a story centered around a human trafficking ring. I believe you'll find her to your liking. She's exactly what you ordered. Yeah, that's gonna be a problem. I mean, there are some moments where switching the tone does work for humorous fakeouts. Who's that? This is Ari, man, but this section's closed for cleaning right now. But as a whole, Burn Up seems to want to have its cake and eat it. Desiring to have scenes where the girls gush over high-powered weaponry like jewelry in a mall, cut between scenes of sex traffickers beating up young girls for information. Are you sure about this? Oh, this'll be like shooting ducks in a barrel. You mean fish, right? Oh, I, I was just there to, to, to have fun. I think oh. you're lying. I guess you need those scenes to establish why the stakes are so high, but it feels so herky-jerky the way Burn Up switches from let's get dangerous, dead serious rescue mission mode to quippy, jokey, wahoo, guns a blazing mode. And the post credit scene is almost especially egregious in this regard. After Maki and Raimi are nearly killed and are only rescued by backup at the last minute in a very harrowing final scene, we are then treated to the credits, followed by a scene that looks like it was meant to be a parody for these kinds of police procedural endings. Are you nuts? <laughs> Just joking! <laughs> but even with all these flaws, Burn Up does its job in being a fun, action-packed Girls With Guns title. It's not that exceptional of an anime, and Maki and crew are easily outclassed by their other lady action contemporaries, but at the end of the day, it's still a very entertaining piece of retro anime with a dub that contains many memorable performances that would help set the standard for localization in the future. It's honestly a shame Burn Up never got its full due. For all its flaws, the OVA feels like a great starting point for a franchise that, in theory, could have been one of the best sources of lady action in the 90s. Oh, man, this place has had enough to fry eggs. I said in theory, not in practice.